Um, so let's start with, uh, when did you first hear about the idea of Poets House? Um, well, I worked for Betty Cray at the Academy of American Poets from early 1969 all the way through 1973. And during that period, I think uh, both Betty and Marie Bullock, who, were, who was the founder of the Academy of American Poets, were frustrated because the Academy didn't have its own auditorium space. Uh, we were renting space at the Guggenheim Museum, auditoriums at the Dalnell Public Library, sometimes the Morgan Library. But Betty kept talking about a place for poets, a space for poets. Um, and, uh, and so that was kind of, once Betty started meditating and musing on something, repeating a phrase, you knew that something was up. I mean, she was a real instigator and the kind of scatterbrained person who actually makes things happen. Um, and so this whole idea of a place for poets really grew up, I think, during that period. The other thing was that Betty was easily bored, and poetry readings had begun to bore her. I mean, even though she really had, in some senses, helped to invent the modern poetry reading, um, both at the Y, the 92nd Street Y, poetry circuits all over the U.S., and then the Academy of American Poets, she'd kind of grown tired of just having poets come and read their own work. And so, again, she, she was thinking about a place where that wouldn't be the main focus, that, that there would be a place for uh, a reading room. People could come and just read poetry and have programs that where poets would focus on other poets and things that either poets who had inspired them or, or whatever. And then uh, during that period that I worked for her, you know, the, I came in at 69, 1969, and the National Endowment for the Arts and the State Arts Councils were only four years old then. They, they, they sort of emerged in 1965. And so uh, a lot of people were, were experimenting with things. And two of the places that Betty really wanted to take poetry um, no, three, actually. Uh, she started the first Poets in Schools program as a pilot program in the New York City Public Schools and had people like Galway Cannell and James Wright, uh, Lucille, uh, Audrey Lord, um, Audrey and Rich, all sorts of people, Sonia Sanchez, all sorts of people going into public schools. And uh, she let the National Endowment sort of take over that and run it because Betty, like she liked to instigate things, get things going, and then if there was someone else who could do it better or bigger or whatever, she would be very happy to let it go. So she let that program go. But when I was working for her, she was interested in public libraries and also public parks. So we got grants from the National Endowment, from the New York State Arts Council, and also I think a few things from the city of New York to go in all five boroughs and do um, readings and programs uh, in the public libraries and readings and sometimes little walking tours, historical walking tours in public parks. And when I remember, I remember when I first started getting the, the brochures from Poets House to see that they were really continuing that with public libraries, uh, public schools, and, and the parks, I was just thinking, yes, I mean, all of this would be, um, would please Betty so much. It was really her, her legacy. Mm -hmm. And how formative, how involved was she in that, the actual beginning of Poets House? Do you remember? Well, without her, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, I do think she approached Stanley Kunitz because she, she'd worked with him really since the 1950s. And so he was one of her more trusted advisors. And I know that she went to him with this idea. And I do think he is the person who named it Poet's House, that that, that story, that that uh, house is, is, is a good word to use. It, it's hospitable, you know. It, it, you're welcome into someone's home and a home for poetry, a house for poetry. I do think that was his inspiration because um, Betty kept talking about a place for poets, a space for poetry, and Stanley kind of nailed it, a poet's house. So I know she worked with him, and it was really the two of them working together that branched out. Uh, Betty um, consulted with, uh, she knew she had to raise money, and of course, that was the huge obstacle. So she approached people that she had worked with before, uh, Gerald Freund at the Rockefeller 
who had been at the Rockefeller Foundation for years and had helped her get some early grants, like for, I think, for the uh, po national poetry circuits, artists in schools, maybe a bunch of different things. So she approached people she'd worked with before and, you know, how do I go about doing this? Um, and, uh, and from there, it branched out to sort of, you know, s sort of new people. But I really think without the, both Stanley's presence and Betty's presence, it really wouldn't have gotten off the ground. I mean, they, they were real conspirators. I mean, they just loved to get together and plot things. And in this case, um, I think they would both be surprised, a little surprised at how successful and it's been and how, you know, it's 25 years old. So that that's really something. And do you, can you tell us how Stanley and Betty met? Um, this is a story that Stanley told, uh, and, and, I, and I think Betty pretty much agreed with this, that basically um, it was at the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire, and Vladimir was either on the board or maybe was in residence there as a composer, and someone said, oh, there's this woman, she's married, you know, married to Vladimir, and she's just a real fan of poetry, and she wants to meet you, and Stanley basically said he was trying to think of ways to put her off. He, he thought that she might be some enthusiastic poetry fan and he really didn't want to take the time because he was up there, you know, working or whatever and didn't really want to take the time to meet this woman. And once he met her though, and, and Betty's love for poetry was really infectious and, um, and all of that. And then it turned out, you know, she was working at the uh, 92nd Street Y. And so, Again, this is, I think, where they began sort of plotting things because at the time, the Y had this poetry series and they tended to have the same big name poets over and over and over again. If you look at the history of the late 50s in, in there, it's, or mid 50s to late 50s, E.E. E. Cummings, Marion Moore, um, the Sitwells, Robert Graves, Robert Frost, really big name poets that they would just repeat over and over again, and Betty's idea was, you know, she knew that there were a lot of younger poets out there um, and wanted to find a way to bring them in. It was pretty radical, and she met with a lot of resistance, you know, because oh, we need to make money, you know, no one's heard of these people, all of, all of the usual kinds of things. But she ended up, uh, she and Stanley started putting a list together, because Betty never presumed that she knew the right people to contact. She would always find a poet like Stanley and say, okay, who are you reading? What, wh what young poet is appealing to you? Who are you finding in the magazines? And she did that with every project she ever worked on. She didn't presume to know for herself. She would consult. And so Stanley would give her names like Denise Levertov, Jim Wright, Galway Cannell, Bill Merwin. And, she st and some of these people uh, hadn't even had a first book poems out. Um, Ishmael Reed. Um, just all kinds of people that ended up uh, reading at the Y, and, and I think Stanley was one of the very first people she did consult about that, and then he, he gave her other names. Well, you know, Mark Van Doren's teaching at Columbia, find out who he, you know, he would recommend, and, and, and just, and, and Betty always did that. She always consulted um, with people to get lists of names and then just pursued these, these poets. Um, and we often heard from Stanley that Betty was the instigator and, as you said, had approached him with this idea of a place for poets and poetry. Um, and also heard that he immediately said, let's call it Poet's House. What other things do you remember about the, those conversations they had besides the idea and the naming? Were there other things they envisioned or... Well, I just remember some conversations, and there were some other poets involved, and we would meet, they would have meetings. Um, I know there, was, there were meetings at Gerald Freund's apartment, at Stanley and Elaine's apartment, at the Uzachevsky's apartment, you know, because, you know, Betty knew so many poets by then, I mean, by the 70s, that she could just call people or, you know, on the phone and say, hey, we're, we're, we're getting together to talk about this. Are you interested? And it, it was very tenuous. I mean, no one quite knew where this was leading, but they all trusted Betty and Stanley. But they, you know, they knew if it, Betty was, was onto it, it was going to be good. I mean, be, you know, she had a reputation for real, real quality uh, things. You know, she did quality things with poetry. So it wasn't hard to get people. And um, just sitting around, what would you like to see? What what can we provide in New York as a poetry organization that isn't being offered 
you know, because we, we don't want to duplicate what the other organizations are doing. For example, you know, giving awards and grants and all of that. I mean, that, that other, other institutions were, were covering that just fine. Poets House wouldn't do that. I mean, but a lot of these suggestions, you know, ideas came from poets because they knew what was out there. And, and do what you wasn't. remember the poets involved with those? And, uh, well, a lot of them, I, I would think, would be Betty's usual suspects. You know, the people she, these young poets that she'd hired for the Y in the 50s. And then uh, I know Galway Cannell and Charlie Williams, who I think is at Princeton now, C.K. Williams. They were two of the people. Jim Wright probably was involved. Annie, his widow, might remember uh, some of that. Um, Bill Merwin, if he was around. Richard Howard, actually. Uh, Betty had work, worked with him on some teachers in-service programs, and she trusted his judgment a lot. Adrian Rich, Jean Valentine, Jane Cooper, um, uh, June Jordan, Ishmael Reed. Um, pretty wide variety of poets. Uh, Julio Marzan, um, some people we'd hire, Victor Hernandez Cruz, some of the people we had hired in the 70s to do programs in the public schools and libraries. Uh, Nathan Whiting, who I think still lives in Brooklyn. It was a, it was a pretty good age range, uh, a real variety of poets. Um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm leaving people out uh, who were involved, but th those, those are the ones that just immediately come to mind. And was it always clear that this was going to be a new organization that rather than a new direction, say, for the academy to go in? I mean, was that always clear that it was going to be something new and different? I think so because, you know, Marie Bullock and Betty really worked out a, a wonderful um, collaboration over the years, but I don't think Mrs. Bullock was interested in something like this. Uh, she had dreamed of maybe having a brownstone, like a little bit ma maybe like the National Arts Club, Gramercy Park, you know, for the Poetry Society, something like that that would be a really elegant venue, a place where people could come hear readings, almost like a salon kind of thing. Betty wasn't terribly interested in that. And I think by the 70s, Betty was already thinking of maybe retiring from being the full-time director at the Academy. Again, you know, she was um, in her 60s then. She and she was easily bored. I mean, she, I think she felt that she had done what she could to kind of jazz up the Academy's program over the years, um, um, get younger poets and a lot of foreign poets reading at the Academy series, all of the things that Mrs. Bullock had wanted her to do, she really had done, and generating the artist in schools thing, the, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And she was ready to sort of focus on something that that she wanted, just really, really wanted herself. So I think it was clear that, that Betty wanted a new institution. And of course, that was one of the things that was so difficult, because starting a new institution, starting to try to build an endowment, finding a place in New York, all of that is pretty daunting. And uh, But I think most of us who were involved just thought, you know, somehow Betty's going to find a way to do this. Um, I don't think anyone envisioned you know, this gorgeous space on, on River Terrace, but uh, it's, it, you know, th it's, that's like the, the dream come true. But I think everybody knew Betty was talking about a new institution. And what, what are some of the, uh, I mean, I know you've talked about some of this, but if there's, I'll ask the question, if there's anything else that jumps, please feel free. Um, what ideas prefigured the formation of Poets House? What were some of the needs that Stanley, Betty, and their colleagues were responding to? I know you mentioned poets in school stuff, but were there other things that was really part of the sort of? I think a little, fr I mean, I think Betty was really interested in freedom, the freedom to do something new that wasn't being done in the city. Um, you know, the other organizations that from the New York State Council on the Arts, Poets and Writers, which had sprung up during this period, I mean, it originated you know, began after 1965. Then you had very old institutions like the Poetry Society. Um, you know, th so there was a lot going on, uh, but Be Betty wanted to provide something that wasn't being provided, which was a space where you could ask a poet to come in and say, well, who would you really like to talk about? Who's an influence? Who has influenced you? Um, the first time I read at Poets House, I basically had 12th and 13th century medieval women poets. 
you know, and um, I'm not sure any other institution would have sponsored that. I mean, I think that was the kind of freedom, and also the freedom to work more with the libraries, more with, with uh, um, park, you know, public parks, um, that kind of thing. Getting getting poetry out into the world in certain ways that uh, really wasn't the focus any place else. And how important was the concept of the library? Did she talk about this, the Poets House Oh, library? you know, and also children's programming, because, I, you know, the other poetry things were basically service organizations for, for adult, you know, for poets. And mm -hmm. I think Betty was always interested. She loved Richard Lewis, and she'd worked with him for years going into schools and also, te you know, working on in-service classes for teachers. So I think also that space for a children's space for kids to come in to hear poetry, little kids, you know, and also... Uh, older kids to hear, just sit with their teachers and, and hear uh, tapes of readings and things, and having an, an inviting space where that could happen. So I think that, that was part of it. And then I missed the, your question. Oh, I was uh, question. How, how did she conceive of the library? Did she actually, you mentioned her wanting to well, work with public Well, originally libraries. she wanted a, a place, she wanted a library that wouldn't be a lending library, but would have a really great poetry collection, you know, very diverse, so that, uh, I remember one of the things she would talk about, because she brought so many foreign poets you know, into New York. I mean, she was the first person to sponsor in the academy. They sponsored Andrei Vosnesensky in the 60s. He came over, and it was a big battle with the Russians and with the U.S. State Department to get him here, and you know, they did that. But, but you know, when I was working for Betty, we brought three Japanese poets over. We had um, Australian poets. Um, you know, it was just, uh, and she'd had Italian poets coming. She'd, she'd worked with that, and, and her idea was when these poets come to New York, let them have a place to, f to hang out. Or if they're poets in the city, they want to just find a place where they can sit and look at a whole bunch of American poets, check out some American, look, look at some American poetry magazines. You know, uh, not a bookstore, but just a place to sit. And originally, I think she wanted, like, study carols. Sorry, apologies. Okay. Originally, Betty had thought of having small offices or study carols that people could sign up for. She didn't want to charge for them, and I think that became a little too complex, mm -hmm. you know, that that might be a little difficult. Um, but just having an inviting space for people to come sit and read. And um, uh, very democratic, just, you know, anyone who was interested in just browsing in, in poetry. Um, that really was, was, was the whole idea. And can you, you've talked a little bit about some of the events that happen in programs, but how would you describe both the New York and the national poetry scene at the time Poets House was born? Um, things had changed so radically in the 60s. You know, with, with the National Endowment for the Arts, you know, starting the poetry in schools, artists in schools, but, you know, uh, in all 50 states, all these things, there was a lot of ferment in the air, and by the 70s, you know, things were kind of shaking out a bit, um, so that, like, the New York State Arts Council um, gave grants to writers, and then I got one in the early 70s, and then, then basically part of the obligation you had then was you had to give readings in uh, colleges and libraries and things, but all over the state, you know, they would plot this route for you to go. And I ended up going to the Adirondacks, which was, which was wonderful. So th there was just a lot of activity that hadn't been there like 10 or 15 years before. And, and in, in by the, by the mid-70s and things, I think things were sort of shaking out. The New York Arts Council was doing one particular thing. Um, the Poetry Society of America was, had sort of t taken over some of Betty's Walking tours, I think the academy did some of those. Well, those two. Um, there was a lot of ferment and a lot of ideas that that a lot is possible um, to get poetry sort of out in the culture to uh, make people more familiar with it. The, the poetry in subways and buses. And I forget who started that. Um, I think it was the Poetry Society. Um, and then the Academy, you know, I think they came along a little later, but with National Poetry Week, you know, that, that kind of energy and push was there. And I think Betty, you know, Betty was part of that. Um, and Poets House was, for her, I think, the most important thing she could be doing at that time, mm -hmm. really pushing for it, trying to get something established. And, you know, one of the really touching things, um, 
and and this was back this was would have been in the 80s and Betty knew that you know, she was dying she had cancer and um, one of the assignments that she gave me because I, I spent as much time with her as I could I would come to New York and uh, she wanted me I knew where a lot of the really rare poetry books were in her apartment because she'd shown to them to me like Auden had sent her W.H. Auden had sent her a monograph of September 29th 1939 I think is the name of the poem with his penciled in corrections Galway Canal had some very small press printing things and then there were just things that poets had given her over the years and um, Betty wanted me to gather all of that together and take it down to Poets House so they could sell it to raise money for Poets House and it was it meant getting everything appraised and I remember Rachel Bellow and I, I think she was one of the first people involved in Poets House, Rachel Bellow and I uh, took a cab full of these boxes down to the, um, the high school I forget which high school it was that where that was the place where um, all of the poetry house, uh, poets house, sort of established. The, found a little bit of space to rent, and we we stuck all those boxes there and got them appraised. And um, I just thought, you know, her wanting to give those things away it had been really meaningful personal gifts to her. But poets house was more important at that point, mm -hmm. and it was quite a bit of money they raised because I remember I got the list, you know, and and um, some of those things were worth thousands of dollars on the market, so so it was great. I mean, she raised money for Poets House the way she wanted to. I felt I felt kind of sad packing them in boxes and seeing them go, but I understood her motivation.